I don't know about you, but I've been binge watching the world's toughest race, Eco Challenge Fiji on Amazon Prime. Guys, it's been absolutely insane. Now imagine covering 420 miles in 11 days, barely eating or sleeping, and hiking through dense jungle, paddling in open ocean, hiking through rainforests and storms, and mountain biking in thick mud, paddleboarding on bamboo rafts that don't really go anywhere, rock climbing next to huge waterfalls, and whitewater rafting through amazingly beautiful gorges. So would you believe that over a year ago, we had an elite endurance athlete woman named Sonia Wick walk into our doors and seek us out to help her train for the world's toughest race, Eco Challenge Fiji. It was an incredible opportunity, and today you're going to get a take and a peek behind the scenes, not just about what Sonia experienced, but how our director of programming, CJ, designed her training program, her movement program. I want to give you trainers a glimpse into CJ's mind. He's an absolute movement genius and coach Sonia through her preparation. I also want you to hear from Sonia what her big takeaways were from the experience and what advice she give athletes wanting to train for something like this an amazingly epic experience. So without further ado, here's an interview with Sonia Wick and our head of programming, CJ Klobiska. First off, just wanted to say I'm incredibly honored, humbled, and inspired to just be in your presence. Whatever, CJ, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> I think everybody should know that. Um, uh, since the first time you came in uh, to Gymnazo, just yeah. You showed up saying, I am ready for whatever you're willing to uh, train me through. Yeah. And uh, here's what I'm going to do. And it's, it's the eco challenge. It's the, yep. um, the world's toughest race, the race that eats Ironman for breakfast. Right. And I am an said. Ironman athlete. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you also said, my body's built for war. And yeah. bring it on. Yeah, I did. But I was scared. <laughs> That's why I walked in the door here, because I was scared about whether I was ready to compete in such a challenge. I didn't know if I had upper body strength or, I, I mean, I, I was scared on a lot of levels. So I came here because I knew that I would be in good hands. I hmm, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna know a little bit more about kind of what you came in with before you came into Gymnazo. So yeah. um, if you don't mind telling our listeners uh, about your training experience, your performance experience. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of Ironmans and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm an 18-time Ironman athlete and I raced the Kona Ironman World Championships six times, trying to win my age group um, there at the World Championships. And in 2014, I got second and that kind of like, I thought, yeah, that's probably good enough for now. So I had really spent most of the time training as an Ironman athlete, which meant swim, bike, run almost every day, um, stretching if I had the time, mobility work if I was getting maybe a little bit injured, but not a lot of time spent on staying very functional and most of my time spent literally swimming, biking, or running. Um, so I didn't have a lot of experience in a place like this and I was always nervous about it and the swimming, biking, running kind of kept my fitness and endurance going, um, but yeah, I knew that wasn't going to cut it for taking on the world's toughest race. I knew I needed something else. I just didn't know exactly what it was. Hmm. So you heard about the Eco Challenge. You mm -hmm. said, I'm gonna do this because it called me out. It called out everybody yeah. who's done Ironmans and said, I am yeah. gonna take this on. I'm gonna eat it for breakfast, essentially, or see what it has in store for me. That, more of that, yeah. So, I just felt pulled, yeah. When they said, this is the race, it is Ironman for breakfast, I was like, oh, that's me. Like, they're calling me <laughs> out. I'm gonna go find a team of Ironman athletes and We'll just see if they eat us for breakfast, you know? We're physically strong, but I had a feeling like there's more to it than just being like four individually strong Ironman athletes. Did you have any idea what was in store for you as soon as you said, I'm gonna have to call me out, I'm gonna go do this. We're gonna get a team and we're gonna go take it head on. To have any, knowing what was in store for me, no. Like the race let us know sort of throughout the months what we were gonna be in for. You know, they had us get certain certifications for river rafting or rock climbing, like ascending fixed mm -hmm. ropes. So I started to be like, oh, we're doing that. We're gonna be doing these sports. I mean, we did 10 different sports right. and I do three sports. <laughs> so there were seven sports in the race that I didn't know how to do and didn't know if I was trained to do. But we started, started to know that those were the things that were going to be involved, which I got to come to you and be like, CJ, right. <laughs> I have to do these things and I don't even know how to do those sports, much less how my body needs to be ready to do those sports. 
Yeah, you came in in March and you said in September, mm -hmm. um, that's when the race starts. I said, all right, we got we got less than six months. CJ and was like, you need to be here every day. And I was like, okay. Yeah, on top of your running, on top of your swimming, maintaining the yeah. endurance that you've essentially built up. mountain biking, paddle boarding, outrigger canoeing, running, hiking, and then also in gymnazo. <laughs> I remember when you came in, it was kind of like, well, how, like, where do we start? There was so much, yeah. and there was so many unknowns as well, not mm -hmm. just for the athlete, but as a coach. Yeah. Knowing kind of the stages of, um, you know, we got to have the endurance, we got to have the strength, we got to have the power, we yeah. got to have the coordination exactly. and the mental grit to truly yep. put them all together. Yep. Um, and so, having not known you, I, uh, I needed to put something to, together to, to test you, to essentially see where that baseline was. And, yeah. Um, when you told me that you were built for war, I said, well, sh how do I? <laughs> How do I challenge somebody to war? You know, like, I didn't want to. I didn't want to push you outside of your zone too much and, yeah. and injure you. Right? It was because right. we had right. to train. Yep. We had to train a lot, overload the tissues, yeah. and, and build some foundational strength in the upper body and core, and um, maintain what we had in the lower half. Yep. So, uh, at least on my end of it, what I saw was all right. We had to have the foundations. Then we had to challenge essentially 3D or the challenge yeah. the unknown. Yeah. Now that you've got the foundation, what does it look like when the conditions are imperfect? Right. What does it look like when you have no idea how your body's going to perform in this next setting? How do you mentally yep. prepare for that? Yep. Um, and beyond that, then building the endurance in those unknowns. Exactly. Those, you know, the the balancing challenges that we did on the bows. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> the crawls that we had on the abdol. I think that was oh, where you really found your. Yeah, app. when I wanted to cry, <laughs> but I didn't cry. Didn't. No, you're uh -huh. like, give me more. I was like, oh my gosh, how much can I throw at her in this hour or two hours <laughs> yeah. that you're going to be in here? Yeah, and I think the thing you really had to navigate all the time with it too was I was coming at you some days first time first thing in the morning so rested fresh like oh let's hit it CJ and then other times I would walk in here mm. after I've been on the bike for six hours and just run for 90 minutes and then I'd be pulling in and you'd have this plan that you had orchestrated <laughs> of like really what we needed to be hitting right and you'd be like oh my gosh you'd quickly have to realize like no we can't do that today like she's got to be on the table we've got to release gotta some restore. things we have to restore so have like that was that push of having the plan but then also having to deal with the athlete and all the other pieces that were working inside of that be right and it's being ready for that right yeah um you came in and said I, I just can't, I'm hurting my ankles, yep. my shoulder. Um, I did a 50 mile ride the other day and I can't turn to my left. Yep. Um, and so we basically had to scratch the whole routine. Yep. But how do we, don't start from scratch, brand new, how do we still stick to that routine, that game plan yep. and keep you on track where you're not gonna get more injured. Yep. You're gonna continuously feel stronger and be able to rebuild yourself um, internally yeah. um, to physically handle whatever yeah. came your way. I, one time I had eaten it on the bike. I had like endoed and crashed my bike and- You just came and scraped up. I, I was just, like, oh my gosh. I, was, I remember being like, I crashed my bike. It was right by my car. And I was like, I don't have time to crash my bike. Like I am <laughs> under like the wire month, to- Two months before, a month before? Yes, yeah. but I don't have time for you. Like right. I need to be at my appointment with CJ in like 14 <laughs> minutes and I'm up on Quest of Grey. And I just remember being like, you don't have time to crash your bike. You need to get to CJ. And I walked in like, I'm here, I'm ready to train and you're oh like gosh. what what you are all scraped I'm like, just fell off my bike <laughs> you're like, like just now like how long ago oh like 10 minutes ago no, yeah <laughs> you're like whoa whoa like let's see what we're dealing with here so that we can train hard tomorrow because i'm going to be in tomorrow like i'm always going to be in tomorrow so being able to adapt mm. that were there were there instances in the race where you felt like you had to make, obviously get through the checkpoint before the time ran out. Yeah. Um, where you were hurting, you had been maybe rolled an ankle or just yeah. were sleepless, right? Yeah. For, for days on end. Yes. Um, would All you mind talking about some of those moments? Yeah. I um, I had a moment on one of the trekking legs coming into Camp Three, so pretty you know advanced in the race before we got to the real cruxy, Vua Falls, crazy bit, and uh, we were going through a river, and I put my foot on a rock and. I mean, we had probably, I had rock hopped about 40 million times in the race so far, but you know, you just put your foot on one rock and it's, it slips off like it had a million times in the race, but my knee went one way and my foot went the other way and I tore a ligament in my mm -hmm. knee. And I felt, I've never torn anything. I mean, again, built for war, but I, I heard something and felt something that was not a feeling I had ever had before. And as I continued, it was a 55 kilometer trek, so like 30, two mile trek. And I, as I continued and kept walking, I realized like what was going on with mm. the knee, that something's not right, something doesn't work. Right. Um, 
And I just remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I wish I had CJ. Like <laughs> A, CJ would tell me what was wrong. B, like if CJ was at camp right now, I probably would feel better tomorrow morning, like because he would know what was going on and something yeah. would get released and we would tape it up and I'd be off. Um, but I, you know, I did just continue through the rest of the race, tape the heck out of it and and gutted it out. But I attribute that to the rest of my structure being so strong. I mean, I structurally was stronger than I've ever been in my life. And I needed every bit of that structure in the race. If I didn't have it, mm. that that knee would have taken me out because the rest of my structure couldn't have compensated for what happened with the knee um, had we not worked together in the way that we did. Yeah, it's interesting to explore because when you came in, you you essentially were going forward. Straight forward athlete. Swing forward, running forward, biking yep. forward. Everything was straight ahead. And then yep. occasionally be, I mean, some uneven ground like rocks or yeah. loose gravel or um, crossing some little creeks or whatever it may be. Yep. Um, we had to prepare you for even more of that. Totally. Right? The whole race was <laughs> uneven terrain. Like Seeing massively. Some of the jungles. I mean, jungle, climbing up things, boulders, slipping, slippery stuff, wet stuff, being submerged, going from swimming to pulling yourself up and over rocks and mm -hmm. slipping off of them, falling. It's like, you don't just need to be prepared to, to do these well. You also have to be prepared to fall down and slip and like not stay stable, but still stay healthy or safe when you're falling, slipping, sliding, crashing, et cetera. Right. You can train perfectly so much, but as soon as the conditions become imperfect, yes. how is your body gonna respond to exactly. that? Exactly. Um, I think it's where we came down to a lot of uh, proprioceptive training. I gave you a lot of things that made yes. your um, sta stability challenged. Um, yep. Not just on the Bozu, but different angles with the wedge board, with exactly. uh, a board on the Bozu that board was tilting yes. while getting pulled by a strap to the side. And yes. Saying it's, it, I was watching um, an episode uh, the other night and it was, they were, people were crossing, I don't know if it was you guys, I think it was another team, that they were crossing the river and it was pulling them mm -hmm. Very strongly, one way, and you yep. had to fight against it while searching your feet on the ground on uneven terrain. On, way uneven terrain. Maybe it's deeper, maybe it's shallower, yep. and just feeling with your feet without any vision, as if you're going in blind. Yep. Um, even when it's light outside, you can't quite see what's going nope. on down there. Yep. Uh, did you feel prepared for a lot of that? I know we talked about the, yeah. the knee being injured and saying foot went one way, knee went another, but yep. there were so many opportunities in the race to, um, to expose your body to that. Ag absolutely, and all of all of those weaknesses in the race you ran into. Like your body, everybody got exposed to all of that. You'll, you'll see in some of the episodes, I mean, people's knees are just three times the size. Right. And they showed a few, but I mean, most everybody had things like this happen. So I think that was what I didn't totally understand is, you know, you gotta train for all the failures. Like mm -hmm. you have to be strong for all the ways you're gonna fall down, slip, slide, hurt yourself. Um, and I think my body, hand, I didn't know if I was ready. I didn't even understand that that's totally what we had to be ready for, but I was ready. Like I was ready and I did handle it well. Mm -hmm. And even through, we had to do some really gnarly stuff after my knee um, had gotten torn. And I mean, I had it, like I still was able to perform. And I think my knee didn't swell. I didn't have a huge like blown up knee. Um, I still felt strong and stable even though a ligament was no longer attached. That's awesome. It's, it's, uh, yeah, and how do you prepare for that? How, how do you, you prepare, prepare for an yeah. injury that your body will probably experience in a potentially five to 10 day race? Yes, that's an unknown injury. Fatigue, mm -hmm. no sleep, yep. less food. Your body's already in very tough conditions. Yes. And so how does it have the time to heal? Well, it doesn't really, it, doesn't it just has time to go and you go yes. into that mode of yep. Perform, perform, yep. perform, we so gotta the, get to the next one. The rest, of, like all of you needs to be really high functioning because if something goes down, everything else has to be able to compensate. And I think athletes who probably didn't really think that way, those things ended the race for them. You know, like right. one, that one thing that went bad because the rest of their body couldn't compensate, they were done. They didn't have any other options at that point. So I think that's where we did well of just preparing. We were prepared for a lot of unknown um, through like good foundational practices that came in handy. Yeah. Do you remember any specific exercises or even pieces of equipment that we use? Like, I'm sure there's some that are ingrained in your mind of, oh, um, that again, you know? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I, the great thing about you is that you tapped in really quickly to what I like get a kick out of, <laughs> like the challenge that I get a kick out of. And, you know, we'd be on the BOSU with a board on the BOSU and then I'd have like, 
the ball between my knees, you know, like get her in the most uncomfortable position possible. And now I'm going to like <laughs> throw the ball at you. And catch you got to catch it fall. and fall up and throw it back, like while staying all stable. And we started having this fun rapport with it. And so CJ would like run, you'd run all around to different locations, and I'd have to like get the ball and get it back to you. We and it was for me, it was like gameplay. Like yeah, you, totally. you know, we, you get the twinkle in your eyes, and I get the twinkle in my eyes to like you start laughing when you're training. That's a good sign. You yeah. laugh and you like, <laughs> see, like oh, he thinks this is, this one's gonna get me, and that just fires yeah. me up to like, no, I'm gonna get it back. I will, like, we did some boxing and almost hit you. A couple times. I think you did it on purpose, actually. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose, <laughs> but that would have been a good opportunity. Um, we, uh, we really worked. So upper body strength was my main fear. I've, right. like, never been able to do a pull-up. I didn't know about the ropes, like climbing, Traversing, fixed ropes. Traversing, uh, Jumar, right? Jumar, ascending, rappelling. But the ascending is what had me so scared because I just thought I would be pulling myself up these things, which wasn't true. Like, it's actually a lot of balance and mm -hmm. leg work. It's not pulling yourself right. up. You're really pushing your ascender up. But we addressed just my worry about my upper body physical strength, which I think helped me mostly in the paddling. Um, my paddling was yeah. really strong because I had come in worried about the upper body strength, and then we really worked on that. And we didn't just have to paddle like in a fixed environment. You know, we were paddling the Thoma cows where we're in this like kind of funky boat and we're not always just paddling in beautiful, perfect form. Sometimes we got to paddle, you know, way out here and I'm the steersman. So sometimes I'm like, I'm literally pulling the whole boat in all these weird directions. Then oh, we transitioned yeah. to stand up paddle boards and that wasn't just like on a nice flat lake. You know, we're paddling up a river that is torrentially downpouring and there's water coming down at us. So max stability and having to really move dynamically on the paddleboard. And then we get to the Billy Billy raft and we're paddling for 13 hours with a toothpick, you know, on this <laughs> Billy Billy raft, like not traditional right. paddling techniques. Like we're on flat water in a canoe. And so I, I think how we really just focus still on dynamic motion with, with the strength positioning allowed me to be very adaptable upper body wise, which is something I've never, I've never had that skill before this. That was what we addressed initially is like setting that foundation. You had it in the lower half. You, yeah. you could run for days, days. literally. You, literally, yeah, and I mean. How yeah. could we utilize that, that mindset, that endurance? I mean, just thinking about going for 30 miles for a run. Yeah. On my end, maybe somebody else's end who doesn't do a lot of long distance yeah. running, it's like, that's like a weekend, maybe a couple more days. That's like, I can do that, and then I'm gonna go mm -hmm. for a bike ride. It's like five hours. So we had that, we had that established. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I noticed within you was, uh, when we started to do upper body activities, there was a lot more freezing, bracing. Yes. There was almost this fear mechanism where you'd hold your breath. That's true. And when I addressed that, you're like, oh my, I am holding my breath. It yeah. was like this kind of light bulb went off. Like yep. I notice I hold my breath, but I don't know what's going on. Yep. Um, so I know we, we chatted about how to breathe and there's yep. not necessarily a wrong and a right way, but there's more efficiency and there's more awareness that can come from yep. um, breathing, especially while you're cold in the water or while you're sweating like crazy and fatigued. Yep. How can you utilize hips, yep. core, shoulders, to go through that paddle and when the water's rising and there's yep. wind blowing at you, how do you adapt yep. and not just brace and brace. squeeze? And I think we addressed that quite a bit I um, think we, initially. We totally unlocked, like, uh, you talked to me about linking movement chains, like being able to make a movement from like the tip of my finger down to my toe, to use everything in between to link those patterns. And I that was like, to me, not to mention the breathing, but also just my lower half was pretty used to working kind of solo and like, yeah, I move my arms, but when I'm on the bike, eh. you right. really got me to start thinking about like, how can my upper body really be in relationship with my lower body and how can, how can everybody kind of join the show? Um, and that, that was a light bulb moment for me, not, not just the breathing, which was a big part of it, but also mm. just that these two, upper and lower halves need to connect and they haven't had to before, but I'm gonna be a lot stronger when they do. And we really had to train that, like. Oh, every every session. Every session. It, my body was not accustomed to, you know, being kind of a whole body situation. Yeah, we, we basically took this rigid rigidity that 
carried you for miles, carried right. you for hours at a time that we didn't want to get rid of because if we lost that, we end up losing some of the endurance and strength yep. that we have in those positions um, to carry you forward. Where you just kind of get in your mind and you're yeah. like, all oh, right, now I'm here and you could just go I like just when go. you hit that spot. Yep. Um, so what we did was start to branch out into more rotations. We kind of addressed the spirals and diagonals of yes. the tissue and had you reach your hands oh. certain ways and you're like, oh, I can't go there. And it's so hard and I would just sit down. Yep. And it was, but it was beautiful because it was like one of those things that this is what Sonia is gonna gonna need to expand out. And yep. so we addressed those spirals and added weight overhead and we ended up doing some farmer's carries with like a power block in like yeah. this loaded position and yep. you were just traveling up and down the turf. Yep. And it was so cool because I was watching um, on, I was like episode two or something, you're just eyes on <laughs> and you're just like strutting up the hill and I was like, oh my gosh, I've seen that look before. She's you in the zone. It yes. was so cool. <laughs> like, so and true. it was probably one of those days you came in like, oh, I just don't feel good. I'm mm -hmm. not hurting. I just, I'm not in a good mental state. Like, yep. just tell me what to do. Like, get me going to do something because yep. I don't want to do anything. And and in those days it was like, all right, we just got to keep Sonia moving. Just keep her going, get her to find her zone. And yep. it was, uh, it was absolutely epic. <laughs> uh, there was, and you talked about getting your upper body to move while your lower body is moving. Uh, there was a, another moment you, picked up the mountain bike, you're walking up this muddy, yeah. muddy hill, straight up the hill, oh, yeah. and the guys are up there, and you're cruising, you're like, I'm coming, like, yeah. just this buzzing, yeah. like, still happy voice, like, somewhere inside <laughs> yeah. where you're still fatigued, yeah. and you just stopped, and I was like, oh, no, she's done, and you threw the bike on you, and yes. you just kept walking, I was like, oh, that looks like what we did on the turf, well, you threw the weight on your back, and you just yep. kept trucking, um, yeah, I there, was so inspired by that. <laughs> there were a lot of times in the race when I was like, CJ would be so proud of me right now, um, yes. that, that moment in the bike, I remember that section was really the hardest physical section for me the entire race. Um, we were in the mud, so, you know, at times, like the section they filmed us on was one of the easier parts of the mud. We had been in much deeper mud that would go up to like mid calf oh while. Just caked on. Just up it. So the whole bike, we've got, we had just left camp as well. So our packs are all loaded for two and a half days with food and all of our mandatory gear. So I've got like a 20 pound pack on and then my mountain bike weighs like eh, 25 pounds and then it's got like 20 pounds of mud on it. So oh. now I've got like a 50 pound mountain bike and I can't, it's just heavy. And then I've got a 20 pound pack and I remember that moment like putting it up and on my shoulders and realizing I've got 70 pounds on my back right now and I wouldn't be able to have 70 pounds on my back had we not done the stuff that we did and then hike up a muddy hill because it's not like I'm walking on a <laughs> no. sidewalk Do with this thing. Day, yeah. Like we're now gonna climb a hill with the 70 pound pack in mud. That I was like, oh, physically, I remember thinking some teams just have to not make this you know and looking back on the footage what they were doing is taking their strongest member and the strongest member was getting all four bikes up the hill mm -hmm. while the people who weren't as strong got themselves up the hill so i mean as a woman in endurance sports it felt really good to be able to do that yeah. for myself and not have to rely on impacting my team in a negative fashion while they got my bike up the hill right then it becomes a trade-off of all right been helping you out for so long you yeah. start to wear yourself down too mm -hmm. and yep. ways mentally and physically yep um, that's not true. just on you but on your team yep yeah. well it was another moment um in the race where you felt like you um, basically had, had met your match and you, you looked ahead and you said it's good it's gonna happen or it's not yeah um, and and you just got up and, and did it yeah i <laughs> i've had, i had a few of them one of the big ones was actually really late in the game leaving the last camp, we uh, headed out on the mountain bikes and I was not warmed up. And we had just slept for five hours in the last camp and then and oh, eaten man, a lot, time, yeah. packed our bags. Yeah, it was, we got a lot of sleep. <laughs> we weren't in a rush. We knew we were ahead of the cutoffs. We knew that the leg had a lot of mountain biking and we're really strong riders. So we were like, ah, we, I mean, all this mountain biking, we're gonna slay. We can sleep a little bit more, right. still make it just fine. We pull out and right away, literally out of the village, we turn left and it's just like hill, super steep. And 10, a, 10 a.m. in the morning, about 90 degrees, Fijian humidity, Ugh. and I wasn't warmed up. And so I started biking and I started getting that loop in my head of like, I don't think I can do this. And I was really hot. And the heat always made me think really negative thoughts. Usually I don't think I can do this or this is really hard. And so once I would get in that cycle loop of, I don't think I can do this, I don't think I can do this, I don't think I can do this. Well, I mean, what you think is what is. Right. So I had a panic attack 
and I like got off my bike and I like did the whole like mm, mm, having the panic attack mm -hmm. and you know let it calm down and my teammate came over and was like what do we do and I was like we just have to let it pass and so I get back on my bike and I'm just so hot and not warmed up because we just didn't get it straight up so then it happened about 15 minutes later same thing another panic attack same cycle of thoughts and um, he finally one of my teammates just had to say look I can carry your bike which you know no one was carrying anyone's I can carry your pack which no one carried anybody's packs but like <laughs> he was like I could do these two things but like you have to change your thoughts hmm. and I was like <sighs> like I felt super like whoa I just got called out like I thought I was hiding it I thought I was hiding that I was telling myself I couldn't do it but I wasn't hiding it because of what was coming out of my body and how I was performing and so it was the first time I was like okay I have to find a different thought to think and I came up with your core body temp is fine. So I just rode, <laughs> I couldn't say good. <laughs> I just could say fine, because you gotta believe the thoughts. So I was like, your core body temp is fine. Your core body temp is fine. And lo and behold, you know, maybe 20, 25 minutes later, a little bit more warm up, a few more hills, positive thoughts, or at least neutral thoughts. And I was hauling, I was hauling. So I learned from that, like, look, it's okay to stop in a race like this and take 20 minutes to warm up. Like if you get out on the course and you're not warmed up and you're being asked to do this really hard, crazy task, like go through your warm up sequence. It's gonna take five, 10 minutes and you're gonna be in a whole different place because your warm up sequence isn't just for getting you warmed up, it's also for getting you emotionally warmed up to do hard things. Right. And I had neglected that and that really like, that took me down and it, it cost us a lot of time in the end because two panic attacks takes a lot of time off the team and, and also changes everybody's morale on the team, so. Right. Warm-ups matter, and I, I never, I mean, I always did them here in gymnasio, like I'm on time, but <laughs> sometimes you just think you're going through the motions and you never really have a great reason to say that they matter, other than like everyone knows you should do a warm-up. Right. Yeah. It's easy to kind of have a, have a bypassing comment that's just like, it's not gonna do anything, mm -hmm. well, especially when you're in that loop. It's, yep. why get out of the loop if it's so strong and it's pulling you magnetically towards that, that dark spot, really. Yep. Um, and so change your thoughts. My goodness, I that's know. a simple, like simple words, but Change can go so deep. Yeah, yep. And that realization, like, yeah, I came home realizing, like, oh my gosh, when we sit on the couch and we eat junk food, like, we know that's not good. <laughs> like, that's gonna have a consequence. We're just pulling ourselves deeper, yeah. But when we emotionally eat junk food, we think we're hiding it. Hmm. Like, we can just, with those thoughts in our brain, and we're not hiding it. Like, our life is the manifestation of that junk food. So are you gonna feed your brain good stuff? Are you gonna feed your brain junk food? Can you recognize when you're eating one or the other? Can you change it? You can, but it takes awareness, and, but it's worth it. So that's so powerful. And it's, I wanna break that down a little bit because it's something that we can, we can talk about, but it's yeah. much harder to actually put into practice. Yeah. It's like breaking a habit that you've had for potentially decades. Yep. Um, since you were a kid, right? It can start so young and be, be driven so deep within you that you don't even recognize it. Yep. Um, what are maybe a few things that um, you do specifically yeah. that helps you just become aware of those loop of thoughts yep. and kind of disassociate that, that that's not me. Yep. That's just kind of this path that I've um, set for myself and yeah. I can step away from it. It's just going to take some grit to get up that hill. It's going to take yeah. some grit to, to change the habit. What are a few practices that you do? I think the first thing you have to recognize is you have to reverse engineer it. Like you, ha you have to make the connection that the thoughts yield the results. And so you can reverse engineer it when you're looking at your results and you're like, man, I'm stinking right now or I'm really suffering. Or you can then be like, oh, what are my thoughts? So it's really hard when you're in the loop pattern to be like, I'm thinking bad thoughts, I need to change them. But it's usually pretty easy to be like, I'm not performing well right now and be like, oh, that's because of my thoughts. Um, going, I, I always, for a long time, tried to go from the wrong direction. And then once I realized, no, you have to reverse engineer it. Like the output is always a product of the input. So recognizing that we all know when we don't like the output. We all know when we like didn't perform the thing or we didn't lift the weight or we didn't finish the run or we always know that we don't like the output, but backing it up and really recognizing that the output is from the input that's the first step and then i think having like not trying to pollyanna it 
not trying to say like, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do this, not replacing that with I can do this because you clearly don't believe you can do this. Right. So you have to find a neutral thought that you believe to be true, which might be I can take one more step or I can do one more rep or I can, you know, something that's more like believable and neutral about something you can do. My core body temp is fine or I am fine or this weather is fine. But if you can't believe it, then you can't manifest that thought. And then watching the outcome and testing, because if you didn't believe the thought, your outcome's not gonna change. So you can try a thought and just repeat it for a while. Just be like, I'm gonna try, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then look at your, your performance. And if it's still lacking, then go back and try another thought. So it's like this reverse engineering and then saying what is still true for you, but like a baby step above what you were thinking before. That's, that's well said, <laughs> seriously. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned something about like priming as well or warming yourself up or just getting into that zone and yeah. how simple it could take five minutes, but when you're in that loop, how ridiculous that five minutes sounds or how right. Um, unworthy of, of those five yes. minutes, right? Yeah. As we kind of disassociate from that. Yep. Um, what's something you do to prime your mind? Is it intention setting? Is it uh, visualization? Is it just all the above? Go and <laughs> figure it out. What's something you find yourself coming back to that is a as a constant prime? Yeah. I mean, meditation is really big for me in my house. You know, doing something spiritual every day is like a, a practice I've taken on. I'm not a good person with routines, so I won't meditate in the same place in the same way every day. I'll, I'll do walking meditation and then the next day I'll be sitting on my cute cushion with my blanket wrapped around me. Another day I like will have my mala and be sitting on the beach. Um, so for me, it's been uh, to keep myself primed every day is directly into the spiritual side of myself because Priming is all about understanding that there's, there's a vertical side to ourself along with the horizontal. And when we're on earth here, that's all horizontal stuff. When we race races, that's horizontal. But we can get very off track very quickly if we're not constantly tapped into that vertical side on a daily basis. And that's what priming is for me. Am I attached to the part of me that knows all this doesn't actually matter and it all really matters too? but not really <laughs> like balance, yeah. yeah am i attached to that side and i found that i don't like things to get stale so it might be reading inspirational passages that remind me of something or a quote or it might be a meditation it, it might be a guided meditation on an app like i will just switch it up all the time to keep it fresh and fruity because i always want to be connecting to kind of different sides of my more vertical self and if i'm doing that on a daily basis then i'm usually primed that's so rad I want to keep going on this because mm -hmm. verticality, um, yeah. there's, there's an analogy that um, I think we share in terms of how we view yeah. life and kind of what's going on here. CJ, um, my, my Yoda. <laughs> it's my um, Yoda. And it's, it's the spacesuit analogy. Yep. Uh, do you mind kind of breaking down just what's it look like to, or what's it feel like to yeah. be in Sonia's lens of, of her spacesuit and to um, kind of compartmentalize these pieces, but also see them as one unit yeah. um, in this horizontal and vertical place? Ugh the moment when I realized that I was not the spacesuit. So here's my sort of analogy for it all. I love analogies, <laughs> but there's the spacesuit, there's the operating system that runs the spacesuit, and there's the dude in the spacesuit. And for most of my life, I ran around thinking that I was the spacesuit run and my mind was the operating system. And it wasn't for a long time that I realized that I was actually the dude inside <laughs> and that the spacesuit and the thing that runs the spacesuit are spacesuits, my body, and the thing that runs the spacesuit, the operating system is really my mind and my con those conscious thoughts, conscious and unconscious thoughts. Um, until I like stepped out of that and realized I wasn't either of those two things. I wasn't my, my mind and I wasn't my body. I was my soul and my mind and my body just exist here on earth to help me have like a super awesome experience. I was like, oh, I had been running around thinking I was just my body and my mind. And so, you know, it, it didn't really work. It was kind of aimless and I got confused a lot. Um, once I had that awareness, I had something else to tap into and I could say like, oh, okay, like your spacesuit's broken. Like your mm. spacesuit needs a patch, your body needs to recover or 
your spacesuit's really strong right now. You can, you're, you know, you can travel on this earth very easily. You have a body built for war, but it's not you. I'm not my body. I, I'm not even my, my mind. Like, my mind and my body work together to make sure that my soul has a really awesome experience on Earth. And when I'm not on Earth anymore, like my body and my mind won't be either. And <laughs> I, I get to like, you know, go pick the next one or whatever. Right. I don't, we all have our different beliefs. <laughs> yeah. But getting that awareness as an athlete was key because when we're doing really hard things, the mind and the body oftentimes are like rip roaring. You know, the body is performing, and so a lot of blood and attention and energy are going into the spacesuit. And then the mind is like the regulator. It's, it's saying good things, it's saying bad things, it's got an inner critic, it, it's got an ego, it's doing all of this dance. And it's just so easy to think that that's it. It's the interplay between those two. And to be left pretty unfulfilled sometimes and wondering why, or is this all it's about? Or that was, that was fun and satisfied my ego. Let me go find another thing like that I can go do and for fun to right. satisfy my ego. But what's the point? Then once you tap into that, those are the tools for earth. And there's this other thing inside of you that gets to use those tools for like good or bad. That's like, whoa, I now know I don't need to chase podiums. Like I can use my tools to have an expansive experience and actually enjoy those experiences at a soul level, which is what happens to me more now. What's the key difference between that sensation and what you experienced maybe before the panic attack uh, when you were um, uh, going for that podium and yeah. you felt that it was one of the next and it was numbing, but it was also exhilarating. You'd get on the podium and then you'd, you'd be at that point and then yeah. it's the next piece. You'd express that yeah. it, it is numbing in a sense where it's self-harm. It can potentially become it can be. um, detrimental to your health. Yeah. So what's the difference between that experience and when you're, um, you're out on in that it. run and you're like, I'm, I feel like I'm in it, I'm plugged in. Yeah, and... yeah it's, it, it, you, are you connected to your soul or are you not? Are you connected to that thing that isn't just your ego? Um, when I was chasing podiums, there was this cycle of like, train really hard, train really hard, train really hard. Why? To win. That was it. Like that was the loop. You wake up every day. What gets you out of bed? I want to win. Why do you train 35 hours a week? Well, cause I want to win. It was always for that thing. And then if I won the next race I was doing, the next day I would wake up and I would be depressed and I would just be, felt, feel lost and without purpose. And so, because I'd felt good the other, the day before from winning, I thought, oh, I better sign up for something else hmm. and chase it again. Like, that's what life is about. Just like chasing podium after podium. And they even have terms for it. You know, you're like post Ironman depression or, oh, everyone feels bad after the race. It's normalized that you're going Oof, yeah. to feel crummy after you have a big high that you will then have a big low. And so I didn't really question it until I found another way, like slipped in, you know, slipped into a different mode of doing things because of what life kept pushing me in that direction. It gave me a whole bunch of podiums and then it said like, <laughs> you're gonna need to eventually evolve out of this. So once I got to that more evolved state, then I realized, oh, like you actually don't feel any sort of, you know, if you happen to win something, you don't feel any sort of dip below because the wind doesn't, it's like cute, cute, like <laughs> awesome. But what right. you look more on like, oh, what did I learn about myself out there? Or what was I able to access inside of myself? How easy was I able to make it feel because I was really in direct connection by doing something that I was put here to do or experiencing something that I was put here to experience. When you're coming at it more from that place, like you don't, you don't have highs of the ego and then lows as the ego has to recover. Um, and your body performs a lot better and it recovers a lot better and you, your emotional state isn't as up and down as we think endurance athletes, they're high, they're low, they're high, they're low. That all just kind of flittered away when I started doing things more to satisfy what the core of me is really about, which is experiencing adventure and beauty all around this world, using my body and mind as a tool for good. Oh, so beautiful. I get just the ability to see from a different perspective, to see from a different yep. lens, and to be able to set up that internal environment that's 
it's like it's got this balance, this homeostatic piece to it where your body is able to come back to center yes. quicker, a rebound. Yes. Yep. Um, we may still kind of ebb and flow, but we're, yep. we're faster to come back to that center space or that. We at least have meaning. access to our center, like when we get off of it rather than wandering around aimlessly like not really connected to it. I think when you open that up inside yourself and you understand what feeling good and connected vertically really, really feels like, you know when you're not there and you really don't get very far off the target anymore because it's a, it's a pretty quick red flag. Something might drag you off for a little bit, but you, you're always kind of now self-correcting back towards that place. Yeah. What would you, what would you say to somebody who's maybe in that place where they feel like when they're adventure racing or they're just an endurance athlete, they're an athlete that's maybe not doing endurance races, but they are chasing podiums, but they feel like there's something more and they're, yeah. they're chasing the greener pastures when it's right there in front of them. Yeah. They just need to look from a different lens. Yeah. Um, if you could say a few words of advice or just kind of a, yep. uh, a track for them to latch onto a path for them to find within themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I would say to that athlete, there's, there's more and it's okay if you don't find it until you're ready. Um, it's okay to be attached to wanting to win. And, um, and that's okay. If you have a stirring in your heart that feels like there might be something more to all of this, that's there for you. It's always going to be there for you. So you can chase all the podiums you want and win all the races you want. And when you're ready to connect to a deeper side of yourself, you will, once you connect to that, reach a place where you don't need those podiums anymore and you will feel okay about it. I, I have talked to some athletes who they feel like they will be giving up something because they're so attached to winning. They feel like they'll be giving up something to explore a different side of themselves. And to them, I say, just go win a few more races. Like right. <laughs> win a few more races. And I hope that eventually you run out of things to win because then you will be forced to look around and figure out what what's next or what more or or what's it all about um, the best thing that ever happened to me was that i got to the pinnacle of the sport because it was only the day after i got to the pinnacle of the sport that i was like wait that didn't do it like hmm. i got everything i wanted and i woke up the next day going why do i feel so empty so everyone has to find that path for themselves but for me, it was getting to the top and then realizing it. I don't think you can shortchange it, you know? I think everyone has a journey. It looks different for everybody. If you're in a place of struggle and you're really dissatisfied and you're still kind of showing up and doing, like, look at the spiritual side of things. You might really open up something inside yourself that makes you a better athlete who doesn't even need to win things. Wow, wow. Yes. Do, have, do you feel like you've lost any competitive part of yourself or that side that, that kept you driving for that next step, um, is that competitive drive still within you or is it something that's changed, yeah, disappeared? Yeah, I would say that the competitive drive in me is like, comes out on occasion, but isn't present every day I wake up to train. Um, I think before I used that drive on a daily basis as my fountain to like water my motivation. And so I don't ha I don't need that to use that as a motivational driver anymore. So it has definitely like tamped down in me. I always just had to compete to be okay. And so when I stopped really needing it to be okay, it kind of subsided. Now, if you get me jazzed up and we're, you know, it's almost comes from a playful place now, my sense of competition, than from a I must win to feel good about myself which I prefer. <laughs> like I love to play, compete all the time and I'll get playful and tough and competitive, but there's just a different feeling when it, you don't need it to satisfy your sense of self. Like you can, you can win, you can lose. I'm probably not gonna lose, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay if I do. <laughs> in the spirit of play, in the spirit in of play. In the spirit of play, yeah. Yep. Play better, you play harder, you play yeah. stronger, you play more like you. But you have perspective in it all. And that perspective is, it just makes for such a more healthy life and a healthy trajectory through really letting you be who you're supposed to be in, in the world. Nobody came here with a, the purpose of winning everything. Like nobody, like yeah. not even Michael Jordan. Like he did win it, but that wasn't, it's not his purpose, you know? 
we we come with such a deeper purpose than to to just beat other people. Man, it's been an absolute honor to to coach you and just to have you. Um, <laughs> bring this like, new side out in me too, um, because mm -hmm. I love to do a lot of different things. I don't, I'm not a, necessarily an endurance adventure racer, but I like to get outdoors and you do. Um, to coach um, somebody like of your caliber. And mm -hmm. it has that, um, just that internal drive that knows that it's, it's an expedition. Life is this journey. Life yes. isn't, we're not trying to get to this finish line. The no. finish line is there. It's always there, but. None of us make it out alive. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've never seen anybody not do that. <laughs> um, so it's, it's seriously, you've, you've got a heart for adventure, a heart for, totally. oh gosh, for, for teaching, um, yeah. for storytelling. Yeah. I mean, we could talk for hours about this. I, I hope know. we do get to have some more conversations as time goes on and yeah. um, we get to go more, but um, I want to encourage other people to uh, check out your blog, oh, uh, gosonia.com. Gosonia.com. Gosonia on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yep, Instagram, uh, gosonia. I got on Instagram so early, so I got the like, you know, Go Sonia. It's nice. kind of a short one. I feel kind of proud of it. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. And it's got you written all over it. <laughs> it does. And CJ, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I got referred like, oh, you need CJ. But it was our work together was so much deeper than preparing me for this race. Um, like this, this race was just a cool thing I went and did for 10 days. And I'm glad I got the opportunity. But I far more value the what we did here in the gym together and what you taught me along the way not just yoda cj but also <laughs> like body yoda cj um that to me that has much bigger rewards and dividends than than going out and beating yourself up in the jungle for 10 days so thank you oh. for believing in me and for will, being willing to use what you're really great at on my body like and get that into me i'm gonna make me cry thankful. Really thankful. Thank you so much. Seriously, it's been an absolute blessing. Yes. Yeah, we'll chat some more we for will. sure. <laughs> oh, thanks, Sonia.